So, so, you know, my career in a nutshell, uh, I never expected, you know, to end up either as chief executive of the BBSRC or before that as a senior vice president for a large multinational company. And, and some of the things that I learnt, you know, I, I will give you some examples, but there are some key things. I always follow your interest and your passion. Believe in yourself. Sometimes, as you heard, that takes time. And also treat everyone with respect because you never know when you're going to be working with somebody again. So, as you said, my degree was in um, physiology and psychology. I'd always been fascinated about how the mind and the body interact. And during my last year of that PhD, I did a voluntary project at London Zoo, uh, sorry, a degree. And that was what enabled me to do my PhD with these lovely little owl monkeys uh, here. Um, I worked hard and played hard for three years. I was even a member of the Zoo B dance team, which was all male, apart from me. And there was one famous occasion where we played in a pub and I beat this guy and he refused to shake my hand because he couldn't stand being beaten by a woman. Um, and then I, I went to do a PhD at St George's um, and uh, I was very grateful actually that the, um, the Wellcome Trust made me finish writing up before I started my job because otherwise I think that would have been quite tough. I was in the lab of a lovely lady who unfortunately is no longer with us called Cathy Wilson and while I was in this lab she had another project that was being run by a, a junior technician and this technician was struggling a bit and so I offered to help and that was great because I was able to increase my supervisory experience and also help write up the paper and got my name on a paper I might not have otherwise done. So my first piece of advice is to be proactive about you know, um, increasing your range of experience and um, continue to seek out new opportunities. In fact, around that time, I started teaching uh, on the extramural uh, course in the Diploma of Psychology for London University. Um, I'd done some lab teaching during my PhD, but nothing had really prepared me for the variety of people who turn up in these evening classes. Um, my first lecture, um, obviously was a, a little challenging because somebody came in and put the uh, tape recorder on and then they switched it off halfway through, which was a bit depressing. But it got, I got better and we um, I, I did it for many years and um, you know, had some fabulous students. And it was a real privilege to be able to teach people who were so interested in a subject that they would come and do it uh, for two hours after they'd been working all, all day. However... After two years of doing my postdoc, which was pr primarily watching rats copulate in the dark, I decided that I wanted to do something a little more applied. And uh, so one of the first uh, interviews I went for was uh, with uh, what was then Beecham's. And you'll see as I go through that all the pharma companies become one. Um, and uh, so I went for an interview and uh, uh, I got asked back for a second interview. Uh, and I'd, I'd worn my only suit with a skirt for the first interviews, and it was for a clinical research associate to work with doctors. And so um, when I went for the second interview, I got offered the job, but I was wearing trousers, and I was told I would have to wear a skirt at work because I would be seeing doctors who would, of course, be male. And, you know, right, so this is 1980s, so it's not 1920. <laughs> I mean, I know, I know my daughter thinks I was born uh, before electricity was invented, but... Um, <laughs> She asked me that one. Um, but, but so I refused. I refused. And so the second piece of advice is don't just do something or take any old job if you know the values of the company or the role are not what you aspire to. So then I applied for a job at Glaxo. I prepared for the interview because it was on dementia. And of course, that was a bit different from sexual behaviour in rats. Uh, but I did get the job. And um, it was a, a, a great place to work. Things were actually much more relaxed in there. You could have wine tastings in the lab, which, of course, health and safety would have a fit at now. Um, but the first day I joined, my uh, department head said, would you rather I treated you as a woman or a scientist? And I thought, gosh, I hadn't realised they were mutually exclusive. Um, so my boss left. I had a few years there. My boss left, and, and uh, a new boss came, and, and frankly, we didn't really get on. And I woke up one day and thought, I've got to change. I've got to change this. So I applied for another job working for Astra. And actually what I did do, I lied about my salary. And I ended up actually increasing my salary by a third. 
because I said I was on law and they gave me law. So um, uh, I would echo what Roman said. Women are very poor at negotiation and valuing yourself and asking for more money. In all the time I worked, and I had, you know, in, uh, in, at, at GSK, I had over, over 400 people working for me. No woman ever asked me for promotion and no woman ever asked me for a raise. All the guys did, even the ones who weren't competent. <laughs> so uh, my advice here is be confident and if you're worth it, don't wait. It's called the tiara syndrome. Don't wait for somebody to put the tiara on your head because you're doing a good job. Go out and tell people you're doing a good job because the guys are. So uh, working for Astra at the Institute of Neurology was really good. We were integrated into an academic environment. But it was a small group and I realised that I, I you know, didn't have any opportunity to expand. And one evening I was at a British Pharmacological Society dinner. I'm sitting next to Ray Hill, who I knew. And he said, oh, I'm looking for somebody. And I hadn't seen the job advert. And so this place so it's important when you, you know, go to conferences, go out and network because it will help you to get not only sources of scientific information but also to find out what's, go what's out there, what potential there is for your, for your career. Um, when I went to conferences actually I, I always um, either gave a tried to give a poster or a talk because that way it's much easier to meet people. And, and actually force myself, you wouldn't believe it, but there's a shy introvert trying to stay in. Um, I forced myself to go and talk to people or, you know, do my stuff that was genuinely interesting. Strategic networking is really important for women and women do not do enough of it because they think it's self-promotion. It isn't. If you are well networked, you'll be well placed to help the people who work for you, whether they're your postdocs, whether they're your students or they're your you know, people in your department. So it's important not only for you, and if you don't do it and shout about the great things your people are doing, then you're actually doing them a, a disservice. So, um, I, oh, sorry, rabbiting away. Don't know what happened there. Let's just close that down. Um, so, so I went um, for an interview, I got the position uh, at Smith, Klein and French, and then six months later we merged and became Smith, Klein Beecham. Now, the new company leadership were really good. They actually did instill a different culture in the, the new company from either legacy companies, uh, but it took a lot of de dedication. Now, I didn't realise at the time I had a secret sponsor, who is this guy who, again, is unfortunately no longer with us. Um, I'm not saying that people associate with me die early, <laughs> but um, called Tony Ainsworth, and he was a gruff northerner. But um, he, I found out later, had recommended me for the departmental head, head job and had been very prominent in um, ensuring that I got that role. And there is a difference between sponsorship and mentoring. mentorship. Sponsors advocate for you and recommend you for things. And I think um, having sponsors is just as important, if not more so, than mentors. <coughs> so at that time, there was a huge challenge. I had to move my department to, to Harlow. However, uh, most people came. And um, we, we had a lot of success in terms of drug discovery, like a, a new drug for migraine. And the head of R&D at that time was a guy called George Post. And I remember going to see him in this big theatre talking to 400 people and thinking, wow, that must take some woof. And uh, 10 years later, I was doing the same. Now, shortly after this time, I became pregnant with my daughter. Uh, I did go back to work after three months because we needed the money. But I also wasn't afraid to ask for my then nanny to come with me when I had to go away on an off-site meeting and, and bring Nikki um, with, with her. Now, once we were at school, uh, we, we had a, a childminder because actually, from my husband's point of view, he felt it wasn't worth him working if, if uh, we were paying for a nanny. Um, and she was known affectionately as the childminder from hell. I did check with her. She was OK for me to say this. But uh, it was the best thing we ever did because um, her daughter is like a sister to my daughter and she's one of my, my best friends now. Um, now, one of the things that really used to irritate me was when I was travelling for work, somebody would say, and, and who's looking after your daughter? I'd say, a father, of course. And you'd never ask uh, a guy that question. Um, and so I think, you know, there are a lot of, un again, coming back to sort of underlying assumptions and although people who wouldn't dream of saying that they're sexist actually are all the time having assumptions that, that, that actually are very rooted in, in the past. So there was a very um, 
There were a lot of uh, reorganisations and I didn't have to change companies. The companies changed around me. Um, a new head of uh, research came in, Peter Goodfellow, and he brought a new boss in. Um, about this time, I did explore some other roles in the, in the United States, but Dave didn't want to move and I was enjoying what I was doing, so I, I, there was no pressure to change. What did happen, though, is that um, this boss was great. Don't get me wrong, he was fantastic, but came from academia and actually needed, um, you know, we, we, it made me realise what experience I had in terms of my R&D experience and that I could do more. So I resolved to, to think about um, where I wanted to go next. And um, what happened was SmithKline Beecham and Glaxo SmithKline merged and um, the opportunity came up to apply for uh, the VP of Biology in one of these new centres of excellence for drug discovery. And I, I took it, applied for it. But I had also at this point, I'm obviously not doing something, I don't know what I'm not doing, but uh, well, I'm touching something I shouldn't. Um, obviously, um, I also had, at this time, I had resolved that had I not got it, I was going to leave the company. And I had a couple of things lined up for, I don't know what I'm doing, but don't worry, sorry. Um, for, uh, to work in the US. And so, uh, luckily, I, I got, the, got the role. And it was a fantastic opportunity because I had to create a new department out of both legacy uh, companies, but also a, com you know, a completely separate new area which I had to recruit into. So it's a, a 160 people. But the first thing I did is I took my, the people I'd uh, appointed as department heads away for two days and we, we concentrated on our vision. Well, I had the vision and brought them along about how we were going to implement it. And the message here is you are only as, a, as good as the weakest person in your team. If you're a leader, you're only as good as the weakest person in your team. So pay a lot of attention to picking your team. So when you are all in higher positions, which I'm sure you all will be, or if not already, make sure that you, you, you do, do pay attention to this because it is a fundamentally important. Um, if you inherit a team, be very strict about the values that you, you want for the team and make sure that your team hold them accountable. And observe how other people lead. And look at sometimes you can think, oh, I don't want to do that. That's, they've done that really badly. Or observe how they do it well and say, right, I'm going to incorporate that into how I lead in future. So after two years, my boss was leaving and I decided, yeah, I really wanted his job. And um, so I made it through to the last three. Tachi Marder was head of R&D for GlaxoSmithKline and he interviewed me. And the interview date was scheduled for the day after I was due to leave for holiday. And I actually said I, I couldn't do it. I, 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 I had, it was a big holiday. I dedicated my time to it. And in fact, Tachi came in a day earlier and interviewed me. And so the message there is there are some things actually you shouldn't compromise and, and, um, and have the confidence that, you know, if people want to interview you, and, you know, um, so, so you have to draw the line in this work-life balance piece and not feel you have to always do everything that, you know, so challenge is important. Um, so after um, I came back from my holiday, I picked up the vibes. They'd actually offered the job to somebody else. Um, he was a Nobel Prize winner with a $100 million dollar facility on the West Coast. So I didn't feel too bad about coming second, but had decided if I didn't get the job, I, again, I was going to leave. And Dave was up for this this time. Um, but, but I did get the job. He had persistence paid because every week I rang the guy who was going to be my boss and said, have you made a decision yet? I don't care if it's not me, but I think it's important you make a decision. And that gentle persistence paid off, and, and I, I had a fabulous time as, as head of this organisation. And a bit like Roma, I'd like to sort of think, pause here and think about your suitability for the job you want next. How many of you think you have all the attributes to enable you to get that job? Right, so nobody in the room put their hand up. Let me tell you that research has shown that guys will apply for a job when they have only 50 or 60% of the qualifications for that role. Women almost always want to have 100%. A, a, a colleague of mine, ex-colleague of mine in GSK, a very senior accountant, was being headhunted for a role. And she said, 
I don't think I've got all the qualities. I said, they wouldn't be headhunting you. <laughs> and, you know, your male colleagues would not be feeling the same. So have that confidence. And a lot of what you learn, you learn on the job. So you're automatically becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy because you're not going for that, that particular role. Now, one day um, I was uh, discussing with the head of HR about getting a coach for one of my staff. And um, I thought, hold on, I've never had a coach. I've, I'd like to have a coach. So I had a coach, and I got this fantastic woman called Molly Shepherd. And if you ever get hold of her book, Stop Whining and Start Winning, I suggest you read it. And a couple of these things have kind of taken a little bit from that. One of the things she did was she went and did a 360-degree feedback for me across the organisation. And some of the things that came back were really positive, but there were some things I needed to work on. One was that I always looked a bit disorganised. Well, that was because, frankly, I was trying to, me and my PA were trying to cram too much into a day. So I'd back to back meetings, and then I'd be late, you know, because one meeting I overrun, and I'd always look like I was kind of rushing around with lots of, lots of, of papers. And the other was, you know, to be more professional, have more gravitas in my presentations. So I did. I got videoed, and I, you know, not, didn't just look in the mirror. I actually went away, got videoed, and got proper training as to how to make my, my presence more impactful. Believe me, um, style, appearance, and gravitas, it's a fact of life, matter much more for women than they do for men. A disheveled man is regarded as a nice eccentric. A disheveled woman is unprofessional and disorganised. I mean, and it's a fact of life, and go out, you know, we just have to play the game. Um, and and uh, another bit of the um, uh, messages that came through were all the other heads of these centres of excellence were male. And my boss said to me, you always talk over people. I said, but I can't get heard if I don't talk over people because everybody does it. The meetings are a zoo. But he had only seen that I was the one that was talking over. And when I stopped talking over, he said to me, you're right, you can't get heard because that's, that was the, the, the behaviour. And sometimes we think we're behaving in a way that is important to us or it's our natural style, but it can be perceived very differently. And a lot of times, these are the sorts of things I hear myself saying, and I've tried to stop myself. Maybe, do you mind? Could I? Probably. You might not agree. Be more punchy. My point is, <coughs> these numbers show. I recommend. And this actually matters. You have, again, as Roman said, time to make an impact and try and use that impactfully. It's very interesting to watch different behaviours at meetings. There was this one guy who was one of the set heads, and after I finished talking, he would always say, I'd like to look at this more strategically. By implication, I wasn't strategic, and it used to drive me nuts because he was tactical and didn't have a strategic bone in his body. <laughs> but now I use it to my own advantage, and sometimes I'll say that. I say, I'd like to look at this a bit more strategically. <laughs> and, and this sort of, you know, the kind of language before about using I... In men use I a lot more. Just listen. Listen to your male colleagues. They'll say I a lot more. And women always say we or the team. Now, it's important to acknowledge your team, but recently I was interviewing people for see, you know, senior men and women for positions on the BBSRC council. And the men were all saying, I did this, I did that. And the women said, we did. The team, I was part of the group. Well, you know, and you've got to think about being appropriate. for, for, for it, When it's appropriate for... Um, being, you know, kind of um, not wild self-promotion, but taking credit where it's due. Read Sheryl Sandberg's <coughs> book, Leaning In. It's a really good book. And in one of that, those, uh, she says that women who over-promote, or you, you, it's a very fine balance, because if you're too promotional, you can be seen as cocky, and even women will see you as cocky. So, you know, again, we've got a bit of a, a balancing act to do. Um, so... Um, so so uh, after seven years of running the said, I was given the opportunity to, to move into a new role looking at external science environment and creating a new strategy. I built an open innovation strategy, got £40 million for a new s s campus, um, innovation campus at Stevenage, and learnt a lot. Um, 
but uh, I realised that my strength was not in building a science park, and so I decided to leave GSK. And when I left GSK, I set up my own consultancy on open innovation. And I tell you, it's a really fun thing to do. Um, and I wish in some ways I'd done it earlier. But I also set up a, a biotech company to try and spin assets out of the pharmaceutical company. And that was a huge learning curve because I was dealing with venture capitalists. I was having to make my pitch. I started off with sort of, oh, this is the fantastic science. And then there was a teeny mini bit at the end about the team and how they're going to make a lot of money. When by the end, it was like 10 slides. This is how you're going to make loads of money. This is the science and this is the team. You know, and, and so that was a very steep learning curve, and it, it, was, it was really important. We got venture capital interest, but every time we got that, the companies changed their mind about giving us the asset. So after three years of doing that, I decided I needed to do something different, and I was very lucky to be offered the, the, um, the, uh, the chief exec position of the, one of the research councils in the UK, the <coughs> BBSRC. Um, I'm surprised to get it because I think I'm only the second woman and the, uh, to, to have uh, a chief exec role in any of the research councils, even the arts and humanities one. And, and people from industry were m much less likely to get it. But I've always done a lot um, outside of, of my, the companies I've worked for in terms of um, sitting on council or panels or steering groups. And it, I, again, it's back to taking opportunities. I have heard many times professors say, well, we offered the opportunity to be on this committee or this panel or whatever, but um, the women didn't think they could spare the time or, and the guys just, just volunteered. And be strategic about what you sit on. Don't end up doing all the pastoral stuff because the guys don't want to do it. You know, make sure you do the stuff that's going to help your career and you're interested in. Um, so, so I've got a fabulous role now where I'm actually sort of, I hope, going to work with the other heads of the research councils and make a real difference to f you know, ensuring we maintain funding for science in this country. Because I fundamentally believe that the, from a bioscience point of view, it's really important for the economy. But the other thing I want to do is to try and help women see that they can, by taking control of the careers and thinking about your careers, that you can make a difference. Because today, a lot of the senior gatekeepers, a lot of the senior decision makers are male. And they're not in a, uh, and, you know, they don't necessarily spot access sponsors for women. But tomorrow, if this goes, which it might do, it's having a bit of a hiccup. Uh, anyway, whatever. Uh, but tomorrow, Come on, close. That's it. We're going to have a much more balanced leadership style. Um, and that's fun. I think that's important for all the reasons that, you know, diversity is important. Diversity of views and thoughts and flexibility. So, so what I would say... Oops, wrong button now. I'm getting confused. Please be strategic about your career. Think about, um, that doesn't mean having a life plan, but it does mean thinking strategically about what you want to do. And Cheryl Sandberg talks about having a long-term plan and a near-term plan. But don't be too prescriptive because, you know, you, you can't always predict where you're going to end up. Think about your impact and your gravitas. Use networking. Use networking to build your contacts. Use networking to get, become politically savvy. Ensure you communicate clearly. Um, use sponsors as well as mentors and be sponsors and mentors yourselves. Take and make opportunities. Challenge assumptions. If you see that people, I mean, um, another example at a higher education institute that I was um, on the governing board of, one of the senior male leaders I picked up through doing some focus group work, he'd gone into a group of academics, mixed men, women, and he turned to the woman on his left and said, are you a secretary? Now, he wouldn't have turned to the bloke and say, are you a maintenance man? <laughs> right? Um, and that's what I mean. He would never have thought himself as sexist, but he's got a set of assumptions, and we must challenge those and challenge ourselves as well. And have aspirations, you know, because actually, if we don't... One of the questions, why so slow? Well, it's so slow 
because we haven't got enough people like you who see that actually a lot of people see that, um, you know, uh, being a senior woman, it means you're juggling too many things. But actually, you, you, you can do an awful lot. You can aspire. And I think it's for the best for both a company or an institution to have that diversity of thought and values. So, so my challenge to you is be aspirational and reach through that glass ceiling and do the best you possibly can with your career in education. Thank you.